So uh, anyways, I want to welcome you if you're visiting today. Oh, that's really hot. We need to turn that down just a little bit. Check one, check two. Does that sound okay? Hello, hello. Hey, uh, Clay, you might want to check that. I know when we had class the other night, um, Bill, like, queued that up for our teacher the other night. So you might, if, it, if you hear ringing or anything like that. So, okay. It sounds loud to me, but I might be in a different spot. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open to uh, Luke chapter 2. We are covering a very famous passage today. If you're looking for a little cheer, guess what we're going to talk about today? The Christmas story. Someone say amen. I thought, I'm like, oh, no, not Christmas already, right? See, I'm that guy that goes in the stores and goes, you cannot be serious. It's decorated, right? Some of you are like going, you're, you're crazy about that stuff. And I'm like, no, don't want to hear that. Right? Not yet. We haven't even gotten through candy yet, so uh, uh, just, just hold your horses with that. So we're going to be reading and talking about the Christmas story. So I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to have a little commentary and talk about how that affects us this morning. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and open our Bible so we can read this morning. Beginning in Luke chapter 2, in verses 1 through 7, and this is continuing on in our sermon series on Luke. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when uh, Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there... The time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, or cloth, excuse me, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and Father, we know that today that Luke um, is trying to show us something about the historical times that you were born in, Jesus. And in that today, what we are to learn, uh, we cannot learn without the Spirit. So Lord, we ask that you would send him today. Holy Spirit, please be with us. Take our minds off of our worldly troubles this morning, our struggles, and help us to focus in on this story, God. For Luke wrote it so that we may be sure about that which we have come to believe in. My Father, there is so much more in this story than just the story of a baby in a manger. It is not part of Christmas. It is Christmas. It is the story. But it's so much more. So help us to see that today and to leave here changed by it. For we love you and we pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So as we continue through Luke, we close the door on the happy family of John the Baptist. Remember last week they finally gave birth to John the Baptist. Just much like, uh, just so you all know, we didn't say it this morning, I don't think you did, but Abby and Jason gave birth to their new child this past weekend. They'll be home today, by the way. So they're coming home. So don't go to the hospital. They'll be home, but don't run to their house. I didn't tell you to do that, okay? But nine months of pregnancy, finally closed. Here's the child. And now we get to the end of another nine months of pregnancy. So we get to witness another birthing today. And as we come to this point in time in Luke, we are reading the familiar words of the Christmas story. You might have I know if you've grown up in the church, you hear this story every year. And to be honest with you, though, I kind of like it doing it this way, like, like right now. Like, have, I don't know about you, but it just takes away a lot of the confusion in the Christmas story. Because I, I'm, I am not one of those early decorators or shoppers, but we get to sit back and enjoy the story of Christmas without rushing through it or watering it down. Because we have a lot of guests in the house. Now, sometimes in Christmas time, you know, pastors do this story and they kind of go through it quickly or they don't hit all the highlights or the ins and outs because you have people visiting, right? So you don't get time to kind of go, what's really in this story today? So this is Luke's account. And you should remember, he's an educated historian um, that recorded this from his conversations with eyewitnesses. Possibly even Mary. She might have been alive when he was recording this. Maybe we don't know. But we at least know some of Mary's children were. And they would hear this story. So we would have certainly know this, and from Luke 1, 4, that he wanted to tell us about the things that we have been taught. So, by the way, I, I also learned this week in preparation for this material, we got a lot to cover today. I'm only going to cover for seven, 
verses in this chapter, but I went through the research about all the different Christmas traditions. And this is why I'm kind of excited that we, don't, we can teach this without everything else involved in it. Now, I don't have time to go through all this, but in the 4th century, the Bishop of Jerusalem wrote to the Bishop of Rome, Constantine, and they, he asked him, can you please help us determine what is the birth of Christ? And what happened was that they came up with uh, December 25th. Now, here's why they did that. They think it was around that time in the winter time, but they, the date's not known for sure. But in December, um, all of the other pagan holidays, and what we mean by the word pagan, because some of you have heard that word before, pagan means other than God, true God worship, other gods and other deities, right? All of that stuff was always happening in the, December, the month of December because it was the beginning of winter. It was the shutdown of harvest time. Let's get through the long winter, but let's also celebrate to keep our spirits up of what's coming forward. So everybody had a different tradition. So all the traditions, guys, listen to me, all of the ones outside of the story of Jesus' birth, I have to tell you, I've got to ruin it for you right now, it's pagan. Christmas trees, decorations, meals, mistletoe, it's all of other, came from other God worship. Now, in saying that, let me also take it off the plate. Relax. Do you worship other gods? Well, kind of, right? Idols. But not like we're talking about. It's okay to do Christmas trees. As a matter of fact, I think it was John Calvin who had a Christmas tree in his house. He put one up in his, in his house, put candles on it, and said, well, it represented the stars in the sky over baby Jesus. He liked that stuff, too. So it's okay to like that stuff as long as you don't get lost in it. Does that make sense? And, and, you know, and really that's God's story, right? God takes that which the earth has corrupted, and what's he do with it? He redeems it. He redeems it. So he says, hey, enjoy all those things at Christmas. Don't get lost in them. Don't get lost in what it's really about. So I just want you to know about that. That was some of the research I had done. I, I have that up here if you want to read about where all those things come from. It's pretty good stuff. But I still like them, and I, and I want us all to understand it is the will of God that we learn this story outside of that time so as not to miss the meaning of the stories. I think that's why he's chosen it for us to kind of know it now. And maybe in the future, a couple months, you can really kind of appreciate the story with your kids and your family. So this story, to me, sets up a tremendous truth for the Christian faith that I think many people get wrong. And, and Jared's already been hitting at this today, is that the title of the sermon also says it very well, is the meticulous and intentional sovereignty of God. That's what it's entitled, the meticulous and intentional sovereignty of God, right? Attention to detail and very intentional about all he does in his sovereignty, his rule over all things. That is to say that not only do we believe that God reigns over all things, but that he is active in his reigning and his ruling and cares about details. Did you know that? Did you know your God is worried about the details? I want to say worried, but cares about them. And he's involved in all the storylines to bring about all things. Matter of fact, Paul tells us in Ephesians, his sole goal is to unite all things in who? Christ. So he's got an aim to it. He wants to be involved in it. And you're going to see today that in seven verses that he's involved in the world from a global and from a global to a national and from a national to a personal level of people. And that means that means that our God is a God that rolls up his sleeves and is not afraid to get his hands dirty. He doesn't sin. But he is not afraid to get the dirt under his fingernails and working with his creation. That is our God. And you should be happy about that. So this is important for you today because your view of God and how he is involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of people, it really affects how you live. Do you understand that? Your view of God, who he is and what he does, affects you every day of your life. And you might not even know it right now. Let me just give you some examples. Look, if you think that God is far away... And you always have to try and find him. Your sin is always separating you. I always feel like he's not listening when we pray. I don't think he's even paying attention to me. Then guess what you're always going to experience in your life? Worry. If you worry a lot, it probably has something to do with you think that you have to find God all the time. Or if you think he puts boundaries up, but offers little guidance in the day-to-day -day affairs, do you know what happens then? You become a person that resents him. Why aren't you helping me more? Like we sing a song, give us clean hands. We admit here at our church at Highlands, we can't clean our hands. We fall down on your mercy, Lord. But if you think that God is some type of God, like having you like a mouse in, a, in a, some type of laboratory experiment in a maze, 
you get upset with him. Or if you believe that he has his hands in all things, that he is meticulous, that he is intentional in his sovereignty, you will have peace for whatever happens in your life. Some of you are starting just now to come into that. And I talked to you about that. And if you don't have view of life like that, if God's not involved in all things, you should be afraid to get in your car and drive home today. There's no idea what's going to happen to you. You see, since the Industrial Revolution, when people began to use science as a way to explain away God, people began to develop the view of this. Here's a word, and I gave you a note sheet with one point in it and note spaces this morning. It's the word deism. Deism, D-E-I-S-M. That's the belief or philosophy that God built the universe, but he put it on an auto-run timer until the cooker timer goes off, and guess what happens at the end? Jesus comes back, it's the end of time. Many people believe that. That's a deistic way of thinking. God created it and let it go. Many of our founding fathers in the United States, that's how they thought of God. Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, that's what they thought. God gave you enough to need, you go do it now. That's what science kind of brought to the forefront. For many, though, this means that they don't even you see the use of prayer because even if you do believe in God, because he's not paying attention. That's a sad place to be in, isn't it? And that's contradictory to scripture, by the way, which we're told to pray. So something's wrong in that. And this is really, though, hardwired into our system. And I, and I think it, it's from that philosophy that we have such a hard time finding a reason for praise because we think that God doesn't even listen. You know, I think some of the problems, Brian, that we have a hard time sometimes singing here or praising God is because we don't think God's paying attention anyways. Why do I do it? Why do I pray? I think that's in our hardwiring. So then when people come, though, to a Reformed faith sometimes, we like the idea of a sovereign God better, don't we? Like some of you come to this church just because we talk about that. We think God's in control of all things. Your salvation being most important to him, he's going to do it. He's the one that will give us clean hands and a pure heart. We can't do that for ourselves. But we still battle with deistic thinking. Here's how, here's how reformed people in, the, in this sovereign kind of camp kind of think. We think that God, sovereign control everything, though. We do have this image of God sometimes, and I get this from when I talk to you, that God sets up a giant maze of your life. He, so therefore, he's putting these boundaries in. There's only one way to get through the maze, and it's up to you to bump your head against everything to find that one way out. But you're safe because it's in the maze. But God is still what? He's distant. Does that make sense? We, you can still have a deistic way of thinking about yourself, even though if you're reformed. But the reality is, listen to me, God doesn't need to set up a maze because he never leaves us. And he is actually very active in our lives. As David recalls from the 23rd Psalm, do you remember these words? He makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And he restores my soul. He leads me and the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God does these things for his name's sake, not yours. That's why he's always going to be doing it. David knew that, the murderer David, right? God restored him. It wasn't David. So today you're going to see this reality in the Christmas story. So here's your one big point this morning. It's in your note sheet. That's all I got for you today. I want to talk about it, though. Is God is present and he is active at all levels of existence. So anybody not believe that yet this morning? Don't raise your hand because we're going to talk about it. Wait till afterwards and you come talk to me. He's present and he's active in all levels of existence. By the way, I have my Christmas cup this morning just to kind of prove the point. Okay. And I trim my mustache this morning so it's not all in my beard. Okay. All right. Here we go. So, all right. So what Luke is going to show us this morning is that when God makes a plan, he makes a way. Do you all believe that? He makes, he makes a way, and he sees that all the way to the end. God is active and in it all the way to the end. So here's the plan that Luke, the Jews of that time that he was writing to, and the first century church, they would have known about this. This would have already been shared. This is why Luke is talking about it. It comes from Micah, one verse in Micah, Micah 5.2. Micah is a prophet from old, about 700 years before Christ. 
And look at this verse he puts in there. Micah 5, 2 reads like this. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Ephrathah is a cool word just to say it. Ephrathah, right? Um, it's from Genesis. It was the original name of Bethlehem. It's a, it's a tremendously old town. It's been around for eons, right? David didn't make it popular. It's been around for a while, right? He says, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah? From you shall come forth for me, one who's to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from the ancient of days. Excuse me. Uh-oh. Would you believe I just froze again? Give me one second. All right. All right. Well, anyway, sorry. I'm going to keep going. Oh, okay. Talk amongst yourself for a minute. Because if I jump ahead, I... Okay, that wasn't good. Okay, hold on. This is not on camera, right, Steve? That's weird. I'm going to keep going. I do need my phone. Let me grab my phone real quick. Oh, wait. Might be back. All right, coffee break, everybody. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, there we go. I think it's because I spit coffee all over my screen and it got mad at me. Okay, so <laughs> my, let me read that verse again. Let's pretend it didn't happen. We'll cut that part out, Steve. All right, here we go. Let me read it to you again so that we know where we're at. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from the ancient of days. So the prophet Micah, here he's giving a very specific prophetic message. Out of Bethlehem, Ephrathah is that old name, will come the next ruler of Israel. So that makes him from David's line, from Jesse. And that last part there from the ancient days, right, would mean, that's in the text there, that this ruler had already pre-existed. He's divine, so it can't be David. David's already been dead 300 years at this point with Micah. Jews knew this prophecy to be about the Messiah, the super king, right? The, the God-ordained king that would save Israel and, and bring them back. Luke is going to take the time and show us how God is involved in all levels of existence to bring about his will. He's active and he's very involved in history. It's all, history is all about God, by the way. It's not about us. It's about his story being glorified. So now, let's get back to the text this morning. Picking back up in verse 1. It says, In those days... Uh, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Look, Luke put that in there so that you will look back at 1.5. In those days means Luke saying, okay, what are we talking about, right? When you read the Bible, sometimes you see a phrase like that. Don't go by too fast. What's those days, right? He's talking about back in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. This is in Herod's time. He would put that as a marker so you could mark in your calendar. See, people back then knew what this, they were talking about. Oh, that's, that's King Herod. I know when that was. And during King Herod's reign, a decree went out. That is a public proclamation that for law. So now all of that in here right now, some of you just said, wait a minute. I've heard of that before. Where did you all hear about that before? A decree that went out. Ezra. How many times did we see that happen in Ezra? Cyrus, right? The kings of Persia, Babylon. They kept giving decrees all the time. What did we see happen during those times? Like, like the decrees from those guys went out to say, send the Jews back home so the prophecy Bethlehem could happen. Give the Jews what they need, money to rebuild that temple. Don't mess with the Jews so that they can rebuild the walls, all right? And the, and the foundation of the temple, right? That should be all returning to you, right? So what, what Luke is pointing out is this very exact same thing. God is not going to stop doing things at work. He's not going to stop using decrees. Do you know why? Decrees this big. Decrees that tax the whole world. This registration, right, is being recorded outside of Scripture. So God is glorified when they always work according to His will. Decrees like this in history is so that you will know that God is active. Because God is the one who ordains them. So that His will is done. That's why He's always doing things like that. You can find these things in the history books. Now, about this... Caesar Augustus guy, well, he's very famous. And that's why Luke also has him in there. That's why he mentions him. Because people would know him. Caesar Augustus is not a name, though. Caesar is a title. It's just plain and simple. It's like the Roman word for king or conqueror. 
Back in those days, Caesar would start out as a military leader for the, the Senate for Rome and until he took power away. Hmm. And Augustus was a name that this guy had earned, and it meant majestic one. It was a title, because back in those days, Rome was getting into what they call emperor worship. You, em- you, you worshiped your Caesar like he was God. So this, guy, this guy's tit- title actually means, it's uber important for them back in those days, to give this guy the title God King. Caesar Augustus basically means God King. This guy's name originally, though, was Gaius Octavius. He's the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. Now, how many of y'all know that name? Like, you've heard of that name. This is his grand nephew. All right? And, Ju- and Octavius was born in 63 BC. In 43 BC, at the age of 20, Julius Caesar doesn't have any heirs. And so he goes to Octavius. And he adopts him. Now, we talked about Roman culture before. When you adopt someone in this culture, it doesn't matter if you're adopted or not. You're full power, full error. You're going to get everything. It's just as binding as if you were born. So he makes Octavius the full um, heir of everything that Julius has. And that means his power, too, as well. A year later, Julius Caesar is assassinated. All right? He's assassinated. Oh, Boutte, if you all know the play. And, and in that time, civil war breaks out in Rome. And it's divided into three parts, three different powers. One of those is Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony represents one-third of the power in Rome. He was a friend of Octavius. Actually, you don't know here, but he married Octavius' sister. Let me tell you something. When you read the Roman Empire and all that stuff, it's a soap opera, man. You wonder where soap opera gets their stories from? This stuff. I mean, you can't, you can't make stuff like this. I, I won't even want to tell you the, the gritty details, but this stuff is great, right? Wish I could write like this. But... Guess, guess who, Anthony, as he's married to Octavius' sister, guess what he does? He finds someone better looking, right? Like, this is like, that, I think about a soap opera. Guess where he finds her in Egypt? Who, who do you think he found in Egypt? Cleopatra. You've heard that name, right, before? All right, so Anthony finds Cleopatra. He dumps Octavius' sister. So guess what Octavia does? Like any good big brother, I'm going to kick that guy's face in. So he packs up the troops. He marches down to Egypt. Then in March, he actually takes boats down there, and he obliterates Anthony, obliterates him, destroys the Egyptian navy. Their navy was nothing compared to Rome. And a matter of fact, that's another prophetic message that was fulfilled by someone else because Egypt got what they were declared to get because they went against Israel. So God used them to punish Egypt. So Octavius suppresses not only Egypt, but right after that, in the Civil War, he, he basically beats everybody up, puts the civil war down, and all of the empire, guess what, finally comes to peace. This is why the Romans love him so much, and they gave him that title, Caesar Augustus, the God King, because he ushers something in what we call, history students, you would recognize this, the Pax Roma. You ever hear that term? The Pax Roma, which is a name for a long period of time, called of peace. My, my thing just went out again, so I'm going to get my phone. Can y'all hold on a second? Which now you're going to see me trying to read this. This is going to be bad. Is someone trying to email me during the service, trying to get me to, uh, to crash? They're like, who is this guy? He's very unprofessional. No, seriously, y'all can talk for a minute. Don't worry on me. Now, I do want you to know, those of you who are visiting, this never happens to me. It's only happened to me one time. So, it's not like, that guy's stupid. I'm going to pull it up in both places just to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, give me a second. Talk amongst yourselves. Cleopatra. Anthony, what would the children look like? Draw descriptions. Roman, Egyptian. Hey, Steve, would you call Bill upstairs and just have him to print out my sermon in case that does it again? Has someone send it down here? Yeah. You got it? Okay, I I got it right here, too. You just start reading for me, okay? (laughs) If it happens again, we'll just tag team. You just jump in where I leave off, okay? All right, I got it on my phone now, too. So It came back up on my iPad again, so I'm going to go with that for a minute and see if it does it again. 
the devil. Mama said, okay. What? Well, <laughs> it's about to get good right now. You know when this happens. It's, the Lord's telling something. All right. Right? <laughs> We're going to get the letters now. Yes, he's involved in it. So this, this is something, Lord. I know it was. Yeah, yeah, right now. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. Stop it. Someone start praying now. All right, so this is good. Some, uh, probably someone's saying, I don't like history. Shut up. Okay, so this is the Pax Roma. Basically, was a name for a long period of peace in the empire. You know why there's a long period of peace? Because Rome was beating everybody up. It was peace brought on by violence. And there was no one left to fight. Do you know how long that lasted? 270 years. 270 years there was peace. Do you know who the, the last emperor? You've heard this name, Marcus Aurelius. Where would you all hear that name from? Gladiator. That was the uh, Caesar that he fought for in the beginning. That dude got killed, but that wasn't true in that story, though, how he died. But it was during this time that Octavius spent time in a lot of building projects. One of these was to develop major highways and road systems, right? This is, he, he actually created highways that people still use today, not the original paving, mind you, but the, the tracks where they laid out. Because what he would do, he was able to establish troops to anywhere he needed to in the empire. He was able to trade at any city in the empire, and it spread out through all of it. So this is what he was, he had some, some big plans. He was doing some big things. And, but by the way, this also proved to be very valuable to spreading the gospel and growing the church only a few years later. Is that coincidence, or is God active? In Galatians 4, Paul states this very basic truth. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. The fullness of time means the completion. Paul knew it was God's work. That is what needed to be accomplished to spread the fame of Christ, and that had happened. It was God's perfect timing. I also like to think, to prove a point, God loves to use irony. Have you ever noticed that in the scripture? Loves to be ironic. Oh, thanks, Bill. You go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Alderson. You ready? Because I'm just done with this. I can't do it. But hey, the toner, the toner's running out. Running low, too. I got to go like that. Thanks, Bill. What page am I on? I might just jump to paper. That way you ain't got to worry about it anymore. Would you like for me to do that? Okay. You're cutting all this out of video, right? All right. Only in America. Okay. So, so I also want to point out that... Uh, God loves to use irony. In an archaeological dig in, at a town called Halicarnassus, don't ask me to say that again, the home of Herodotus, who was a famous Greek philosopher back in the days of Socrates, there is an inscription on the wall there saying, Caesar Augustus, Savior of the world. Just think about that. Savior of the world. Caesar in his day had been credited with saving the world through a physical means and conquering and building roads but what really happened is that God enabled him to bring peace, building a system by which Jesus' gospel would spread through 70 million people in that day. Rome represented a third of all the world at that time. The Savior of the Roman Empire was used by the Savior of the world because God is meticulous, because God is intentional, and he uses all things because he is active at all times to bring himself glory. Would you agree with me? So I also want to stop there for a moment, though, and mention that Augustus was not a hero of the Jews. They weren't crazy about him. He had brought more paganism to their lands, claiming their God, given lands as their own. This is the land given to them by God through Moses right at that time. They had also started taxing the Jews heavily on top of what Herod was already taxing him, which they hated that guy too. Herod was an Edomite, right? He was an enemy, actually, of the people of Israel. Edom had betrayed Israel long ago and had turned against them with Babylon to fight against them and ultimately destroy them. That's why they're still, they still fight about over this stuff today, guys. This is still going on there. Herod had used their money and he heavy taxed them to rebuild the temple gigantic light to make him money so people would come visit this place, right? And all of that, God still used these men. Let me say that again. Evil, bad, violent men, God still used them. He puts them in power to prepare the way and set up the scenario so that the Messiah would come. 
Why do you think God made the temple so big is that when Jesus comes up next to it, he goes, I am the center of God of worship, not that thing. It's to make contrast. It's to use irony so that we could see God active. And Jesus even proclaimed the death of that temple 70 years after he left. So that means for us that you may not like the situation you're in now. Listen, you might be under control of some things that are out of your control, right? Whether it's people, places, persons, or things, any kind of those nouns, right? You don't like where you are at. That does not mean God cannot use it. And it probably most certainly means that God has probably ordained it to happen. Do you believe that? God always uses the zealousness of an enemy to do his will. So when we spend a lot of time hating those that come against us, it really is a waste of time. Look, I don't know where you are in politics right now. You've all been watching this stuff for the last few months. It is crazy. It doesn't matter what you like or you don't like. God uses it all. It's not up for you to like it, but you should be praying about it. Instead, we need to be like Ezra. We need to be like Daniel. We need to be like Nehemiah and pray for those in rule over us that God's will is accomplished through them. God will use our leaders to bring in the kingdom of God. He's over every king. And this was the first, back to our scripture this morning, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, what's that, all that mean right there? Well, there's so much to say here, but we're already short on time due to technical difficulties. But please notice, there is a registration going on here, right? That is, with the increase of safety and the hefty empire work on the roads, Augustus orders a registration for a tax. The first one happened about 8 B.C., and he would do this every 14 years. He then, and it happened all the time during the Pax Roma, that peace, all for 270 years, this would happen. Now, just now, though, Luke mentions that all of that here so that you know and I know that when it happened, along with Quirinius, who's also mentioned outside of Scripture, he wants you to know because you would know that name as well. But the strange thing is, though, though Caesar... He didn't require Jews to go home. Let me say that again. It wasn't Augustus that made the Jews go home. There's something going on here. See, the Jews, back in those days, liked to go back to their homes every seven years. Now, you Sunday school kids in here, you know, understand that means because seven years is the year of grace. And people would go back home. And people would make sure that their land had been returned to them if they were in debt to somebody. Because you didn't want to use your land. Land was part of your salvation. You wanted to keep your name in the books. And people would return back home and make sure that their names are still in the books. And any kids that they would have would be recorded for that town. So the Jews had gone, were going home at the same time that this was happening. And they still had claim to the, claims to these ancestral lands. So that means in Joseph's case to make sure that they still knew Guess what? That he had a claim to the throne. That was Joseph. So he was going home. Joseph's leaving and going to Bethlehem would have gotten him and Mary both recorded in the registration in the town records. That is, Luke is saying, if you want to know that this is true, you can actually go to Rome, look at the registration, and you can go to Bethlehem, look at it, and it matches. That's big stuff back then. Check the records for yourself. Because, see, God uses ordinary means of something like a tax registration to record the mighty hand of God present and active in what? All of life. In all of existence. Verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed who is with child. Well, Joseph, when, he, when we look at the text, I think he also kind of had a plan in his mind. Now, this is not from, I, I've read a lot of guys who kind of thought the same thing. Right? You have to play detective sometimes. Like, what are we learning about God? Remember, that's the important thing. It's not about you. It's what we're learning about God. So he takes Mary in the dead of winter. Back in those days, that was bad weather, too. All right? That means lots of rain, sometimes snow, cold weather. He did up to the land in Bethlehem. It was a rise up to the mountain regions. He would have gone uphill with a nine-month pregnant wife. We all saw Abby, how grumpy she was. Imagine this, okay? Right? She's like, ah! Right? You know, like, imagine in the winter riding a donkey uphill. It's not good, okay? It's not good. Don't tell her I said that. It's recorded, but don't tell her I said that, right? But, right, so I think he had a plan in mind. And here's what we know at the time from Matthew what happened with 
Joseph. I'm going to look one other place this morning. In Matthew 1, pick up in verse 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, this is back when he found out that, that Mary was pregnant, the angel of the Lord had commanded him to take his wife. So he did, and he took his wife, but he knew her not. That means he did not have sexual relationships with her until she had given birth to that son. That's what was going on right here. Now, it seems that Joseph went ahead and married Mary. Went ahead with the process. But Luke records her as betrothed, though. And many scholars would say that this is so that people in the future would not try to say that Jesus was Joseph's physical child. That's important because the, it's not a myth and it's not a legend. Jesus was born of a virgin. He is God's child. But Joseph knew her not, according to Matthew 1, even though he married her. But she was legally bound to him now. No more putting her away. Joseph, just as much as Mary here, had to show a lot of faith to do this. Like, we talk about Mary and the shame, and I can imagine him having to go back home to tax, and he's having to plan all this out in his head. 15, 16-year-old boy thinking about what's going to happen here. You know, we always think about the shame that Mary had, but as soon as he married her, guess who got the shame? It's Joseph. He's the one that seduced her. He's the one that led her astray. He had to take on a lot. And the shame that was cast on Mary was probably put on Joseph now. And he tied himself to her for the rest of his life to bring about God's plans. God's involved nationally, and he's also involved personally, isn't he? Sacrifice. That's what this is about. What is it, let me ask you a second before we go any further this morning. What is it that God is asking you to do right now that requires you to shine less? As John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. In the light of others, but it's more for the unselfish gain of God. Where is God calling you to sacrifice something you really like so that God can gain glory? Because that's what Joseph had to decide on. Is it your prestige? Is it something from your family? Is it a job? What is that? Because believe me, God is active in your life. And these are our tests that we must go through. My friends, God is involved in every aspect of your life. Where do you need to surrender his guidance for you right now? Think about that. So Joseph takes Mary home with him to register them both so that it would be recorded that they were married. And in verse 7, we see this title, the firstborn son would become the next heir in the line to the throne. Verse 6, it says, And while they were there, the time gave, came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. Now, wouldn't you know it? It says there in verse 6, It just so happened that while they were there, she gave birth. Well, guess whose name got on the town registry of that trip? Jesus. How apropos. Not only that, but Jesus would be recorded as the firstborn son. You know what that means? Everything that family has goes to him. He is the firstborn heir. You see, Joseph and Mary were both in the line of the lineage of David. Mary was too. You'll see that in chapter 3 of Luke. Joseph, being a poor carpenter, he didn't have much, but he had one thing that he could pass on to his son. You know what that was? The line of the throne. Is that coincidence or is that God that is active in all of our life? You see, these things, guys, what I believe is that they're not just coincidences, they're miracles. Because God is active and involved to bring about his plans. There is no way God could have been sitting back to let this just come about. There is not even the point that may I'll just make a maze and it might happen and it'll take a while. It was specific to the time, to the date, to the nine months pregnancy, to the time of going back home, to that town of Bethlehem, all that so he would come about. This shows God's hands all in it. There is no way he could have been sitting back. Because until the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, this is the most important part of all of existence. Do you think God would have sat back? This is not a deistic God. He's very involved. One more thing to point out, that God does put signs everywhere to get your attention. Irony, again, is something that God likes to use to point things out. Verse 7, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling cloth, and she laid him in a manger. 
Sorry, but there was no place for him in the end, no place for them. Wrapping babies in strips of linen was much the same way that Jason and Abby are wrapping their newborn baby this morning, right? You've all got money. If you've gone through that, you put your baby in that blanket, and you like put the, and you hold it, and you kind of tuck it in the one. I don't even know how to do it anymore. But you wrap it up, and then you kind of tuck it in like a burrito, right? And you kind of wrap it up, and you fold it, and you wrap it up so that the baby can't move. It's like in a cocoon, right? This is what this is. So sometimes they will use individual wraps and wrap limbs first, and then, then they would wrap up the body. See, that is to help the child feel comfortable, in case you're wondering, as it's going from the comfort of its mommy tummy, always feeling a presence around it, right, to going through a violent action. You're squeezing that baby through a small hole into the world, and now it's all open, and all the feelings are there, and it's feeling nothing but air. It's violent to being secure again, and that's why they would do this. It's also the wrapping action was well thought to have kept that infant's bones back in that day secure in case there was any fractures because, ladies, and I hate to paint a picture here, but it wasn't pretty back in those days. No nice instruments. It was like, give a pull, right? This is what it is. It's violent. So that was to secure the baby's limbs and make sure that they straight. If something happened or the head, if it got crushed a little bit. This is important for that child. So we see that he's laid in a manger. Now, there's no real quick... So, so real quick, here, here, here's the picture of this in the text, so we're accurately, historically correct here. The inn is a title. It means that there's actually only one inn in Bethlehem. It's the inn. Like, you would go there back in the days and goes, where do you stay? The inn. This is not a three-story structure, like you and I like to think about the Hilton. This is probably, probably had a couple of rooms at most and a common room to feed the guest. And people shared the rooms to sleep in them. Families, all families would get gathered in there, right? All close and comfy. And it would have been taken over, though, at this time of year because of the registration by the Romans and the tax collectors. There's no room in the inn, not because people were so mean, but because it was already filled up with people outside of this town. That means people coming in for their seven-year checkup who couldn't stay with family had no place to stay out of bad weather but the travelers would have been offered to stay in where you do like our cars in the garage. You brought animals, you stayed with them wherever they put them, whether it was a cave or a built structure on that side of that building. So, guys, here's the reality is that Luke wanted to make sure you understood there were other witnesses to the birth of Jesus. There were other people in this area. So most probably, most people believe there are other people in this, whether it's a cave or, or a stable. So Jesus, the Messiah, divine King of Kings, is brought forth in a public declaration by scared teenagers into the stench of not just animal, but human existence. Around lowly people who also knew him not. Didn't know who this couple was from Adam. He came as the lowest of lows to serve those he had given up as equality, according to Philippians 2, with God. He counted something not to be counted, but came to be accounted with his people. He accumulated in that stall, in his cloth, that new linen, because it would have gathered all the smells of that stall, the messiness. It would have protected him from the crud on the floor. And he bore that right from the get-go of his birth. It's a great picture God is picturing for us is that Jesus came into the filth of the world with us. Not not opposed to us, to be with us in grace so that we would know he knew what it was to be us. In the great incarnation of God, according to John 1, when the word took on flesh. This is meticulous. This is intentional. This is not haphazard. Jesus, who should have never had this. Like, I think right now as I was studying for this, if if we really know our Lord, we all should be in an uprage about this, that he had to be born like that. It was our fault. It's also for our good. But he began to bore the marks of true humanity to know the effects of sin while never sinning. Cloth. You know, it comes up again in the story, don't you? Talk about irony. 
Jesus' body at the end of his physical life was wrapped in cloth. Do you remember it? Two men go to get his body. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus from the book of John. He who probably converted them to believe and spent a life fortune on the herbs to embalm his body. I said the cloth this time wasn't to keep him safe. Because he had endured again a violence that we had never seen before. And now his body was held together by cloth. Then it was covered by the filth of this sin that he carried and bore it on the cross. And he bore it while not sinning all the way to the end. There had been no room in the hearts of men for the Messiah, had there been. Like there was no room in the end. And he was cast out of Jerusalem, his city, and stuck on a hill where thieves and murderers and rapists cloth. On the third day, he arose. The bandages were laid on the bench inside that tomb. His shroud that had covered his face, of course, it was folded. What does that even mean? It was laid down. It's also interesting, ironic, that a man named Joseph is the one that prepped his body, and it was a woman named Mary that found him. Mary Magdalene, and Mary also the mother of John and James was there too, and they found the cloth inside that tomb. Jesus had endured, and he will never need that cloth again. We see in the stories, after the resurrection, he doesn't care any longer if there's no room for him. He goes through walls. He goes to his disciples. He says, peace, be still. It's okay. I'm back. Jesus symbolizes now how his father has been all along. He images it to his people. For those he loves, you can't keep them away from you. I want to leave you with a message that Jesus gave to the churches. You know, in Scripture in the New Testament, all the New Testament is written to us, present day. I want you to understand that. Paul's writing to churches, John's writing to churches, Peter's writing to churches. Well, that's to be carried through time. They're written to us. There's a message that Jesus sends to us through John in the book of Revelation, beginning in verse chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. Listen to his words to you this morning. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Those that Jesus loves, he corrects, not punishes. My friend, that hard thing in your life right now, if Jesus is sovereign and he's active, and very involved in those circumstances you're going through right now because he loves you. Those hard things that you're going through, he is allowing them because he loves you. And he stands at the door of his home, his people, his church. Are you responding to him this morning as an obedient servant? And are you repenting of those things that you need to? Or are you holding him at arm's length still? Repentance is not a choice for God's people. You know what it is? It's a reaction. If you are God's people, when he comes through the door, you react and you repent. To the truth that God is active, he is present at all levels of existence. Repentance is only a choice if you believe he is far away 
and doesn't care? Are you a secret deist this morning? Or are you a repentant sinner rejoicing that Jesus comes looking for you, wanting to bring you peace because he's very real and there are no coincidences? Amen? Let's pray. Father and Lord, who is here with us in the spirit, make yourself very real to us. Lord, we've heard your word this morning, that there are no coincidences in life, that your sovereignty is not far away and independent. It is up close, it is personal, it is active, and it is alive. The same spirit that was there, that manger is here with us, coming for us, loving us, bringing us peace for those who respond as a servant in obedience and repent, opening the door for you. Lord, may our people come to know of that time. Restore them their strength this morning. Restore unto them their righteous standing in you. Let them know that you love them and help them to repent, Father. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So as we go to communion.